opening of our faculty lecture series this spring, which is um, really asking the question, what is the promise of democracy? And uh, this event is sponsored by our um, Democracy Commitment Initiative. Um, we have several uh, other uh, lectures in the series coming up, uh, two in March and then again in April. So um, look out for those uh, lectures coming up. Today we're going to hear from Professor um, Jim McIntyre, and he's going to look at this question from a historical perspective and talk to us about democracies in the past and what democracy looks like for us today or what the future is of, well, possibly what the future is of our democracy. Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so there's some disclaimers I have to get out of the way first. Um, when it comes to talking about democracies and republics and historical examples, Okay, there, there are a lot of things you just need to keep in mind from the outset. Um, first off, this, this talk is going to mix a little bit of history and a lot of interpretation. The historical part is very easy. The facts are the facts. They say pretty much the same. The interpretations are my own. Uh, they are questionable, which is great for you during the second half for questions. And I encourage you to question those interpretations. All right. And while the United States is currently the longest surviving republic in the modern world, the number of qualifiers there should say something. Okay. We are far from the only republic currently in existence, and we're also not the only republic that ever existed. Um, and so to give you some idea of some historical examples that maybe will help us capture our current historic moment, and perhaps look at where we might be going or where we could potentially go. I had to narrow down the field uh, a little bit. Okay, so I looked for examples of republics and democracies that had some longevity, that lasted for a while. Which means in some cases, a student asked me just before I came over, am I going to talk about the French Revolution and the French Republic, 1789 to 99? No. So all my Western Civ II students who are here, you can breathe a sigh of relief. We're done with that. Okay. Why? Because it only lasted a decade. Well, if our republic is older, that's not a really fair comparison, right? Um, likewise, the Puritan Republic of Oliver Cromwell lasts roughly a decade, so we're not going to address that. Um, so really, to, to be upfront, my thesis is that by looking at some historical republics that have some qualities that are like those of the modern United States, they can give us a better understanding of, where, of the position we're in historically. Um, I've also chosen to include one example of a democracy, and of course it has to be the key example from the West, ancient Athens. Okay. Athens becomes a democracy at the very end of the 6th century BC, when an Athenian noble, Cleisthenes, leads a revolt of the Athenian people against a, a sort of uh, junta that were in control. And then they have a very pure democracy um, where all men can be, all men born in Athens to Athenian parents can be citizens. Very narrow franchise by our modern standards, right? Very small group of voters. But it works pretty well. Um, Athens goes on to become quite wealthy. They dominate trade in the Aegean for some time. Uh, there's a couple of different dates given for the end of the Athenian democracy. One is uh, 338 BC. That's when Philip of Macedon and, and his son Alexander, who will go on to greatness, right, come in and essentially take power from the Athenian ruling class. But it's, you can make a good case for before this, right, 404 BC, Athens and loses this huge war to an alliance of Sparta and a several other Greek states. It's called the Peloponnesian War. And one of the things the Spartans do is put a government in power. It's called the 30 Tyrants. And they basically say, you guys are in charge. Athens, deal with it. To me, that doesn't sound very democratic. You know, they, they do displace this after a time. Um, and there are problems, and, and the reason I, I draw attention to the Peloponnesian War is simply because during the war, the Athenian government started doing a lot of things like restricting who could hold which office, um, getting rid of people that they didn't like for the good of the state. One of them, is, you know, one of them got his revenge. Um, this one general who really made some mistakes and lost a few battles, so they kicked him out of Athens forever. 
and he got his revenge by writing a history of the Peloponnesian War. His name is Thucydides, and his is the best, most thorough account of the whole period. So he kind of got the last laugh, right? You know, I'm going to get all my enemies for all eternity. Um, okay, fine, that bombed. All right, moving along then. We'll have the Roman Republic. Um, 509 BC, right, the, the Romans get rid of their king. It's, he is replaced by the Roman Senate. Uh, out of the Senate, you get these two co-leaders, right, the consuls and so forth. And I'm not going to get mired down in their government structure. This lasts until 27 BC. Again, very long-lasting republic. Um, 27 is when Augustus Caesar becomes, in fact, if not in name, the first emperor. But, so why does Rome go from being a republic to an empire? Well, Rome, as many of you know, expands. Right? They con at one point, they control most of Western Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Um, they never really change their government substantially. So in other words, as they're adding all these new territories, they're still trying to run them the same way as they ran a small city on the Tiber River. Uh, when they do finally come back and, and look at, okay, we've got to make reforms here, many of the people who were dominating those reforms were very corrupt and looking to basically capitalize on whatever they could do. Okay. Um, here's the first semi-modern republic. Okay. Not bad. Any, any Venetian Republic fans? Poor Venice. I like this one. Um, <laughs> Seven, it forms in the seventh century. Um, they initially created this post Doge, D O G E, for anyone who's taking notes, who ran the city as somewhat of, a, of an elected tyrant. Um, but over time, the council very much circumscribed his powers. Venice survives until 1797 as an independent republic. Initially, they made lots of money uh, covering trade in the Mediterranean. One of the things Venice was very important in between 1095 and roughly 1300 were bringing crusaders to the Middle East. Okay? So they dominate the, in, in sort of transporting crusaders. What's important about that is as these ships go from Venice to you know, the ports along the, the Levant, they make trade contacts and they keep that trade going. Venice becomes enormously wealthy. Um, and then they decide to use that wealth to try and control much of the area around them. They expand inland, okay, um, and they also expand down the coast of the Aegean. And this is what leads them into trouble. They, they get into fights with uh, the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, which is very large and very powerful. They also get into fights with the Austrian Empire, again, fairly large and powerful. And so what basically happens in the early 1700s, Venice and the Ottoman Empire go to war. Um, the Ottomans win. While they're busy fighting the Ottomans, the Austrians to the north go, huh, well, there's an opportunity, and they invade. So essentially, you know, they, they've taken on opponents that are far too large for them to deal with. Um, by 1796, Venice is limited just to essentially a series of islands. Um, and they really cease to exist thanks to Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, who makes a treaty with Athens, or Athens, Austria, uh, and says, look, you know, we'll take this part of Italy, you take Venice, and we'll divide it between us, and then ceases to exist for a time. Um, another example from Europe, during the same, roughly the same period, the Dutch Republic, okay, Formed in 1581 out of seven provinces in northern Europe that initially belonged to Spain. These are called the Spanish Netherlands. They're um, acquired by Spain through their connection to the, through the royal family of the Habsburgs. Religion plays a big role in the formation of the Dutch Republic. There's a religious reformation going on in northern Europe. These northern states are converting to Calvinism. Spain remains very staunchly Roman Catholic. So these seven states form an alliance. They break away. Um, they form their own loose sort of confederation initially, but then it coalesces. And so you have the seven republics each one of them sends a representative to what they call the states general. And then they choose one of their own. Usually the, the prince of one state, Orange, it's the name of the state, 
um, to be the stadtholder, who's the, the executive. Again, trade is key. The Dutch take over the Baltic grain trade, makes them a lot of money. Um, it helps that they provide a ruler for England. Okay, they, ex they, they build, they're very good at maritime technology. This gives them an edge in expansion. They go out through the North Atlantic, into the Indian Ocean, into the Caribbean. Um, they start small, what they call factories throughout. So these are just little trading posts. This is a really good thing if you're the Dutch, if you stop and think about it, right? Not a lot of land mass, not a lot of people, so you can't do what England or France try to do in places, right, where they carve out whole areas of territory. You simply can't support it. But you can, you know, put up a little white hen here and there right, and trade with people, right? And I use white hen intentionally, by the way, um, <laughs> because after a while, they don't do so well, okay, their business, they, but they, they did show that they had secured some prime real estate, which makes the other larger empires on the block, like England and France, uh, who want to take over and boot them out, do much of that. Um, again, in the case of the Dutch Republic, they last until 1795. Two things. 1787, uh, the Dutch actually start having their own internal revolution. A group wants to get rid of the, st the stadtholder, get rid of the states general. Why? Because some of the other areas that were under the control of this republic had no representation in that, in that body, so they want more equality of representation. It's kind of like a precursor to the French Revolution. Okay? Um, it leaves the Dutch Republic very internally divided um, and weakened so that when the French under well, one of Napoleon's actually precursors, a guy named Osh, a French general, invade, it's very easy for them to take over and they create this sort of puppet government they call the Batavian Republic. And then finally, um, the last republic, which is very modern and very well documented, the third, the third French Republic, which lasts from 1870 to 1940. Um, anyone, here's the Trivial Pursuit part, anyone know which French Republic we're on now? <laughs> we're up to five, okay, so far we're holding steady at five. Um, first one is 1789 to 99, second one is 1848 to 52, okay, so they they've keep trying this Republican form. Um, what happens here is there was a second French Empire under Napoleon III, they get into a war with Prussia, the last war of German unification, Prussia defeats them stunningly. I mean, crushes them in weeks. But, so, so this sort of monarchy under Napoleon III collapses. You have this group that forms their own government in Paris called the Paris Commune. And out of that gradually emerges this new republic. Uh, one of the early leaders, this, this guy, Adolphe Thiers, said, republicanism is the form of government which the French find least repulsive. Does that sound real promising to anyone here? <laughs> Why are we going with this government? Well, it's the one we don't like the least. Okay, so, and, and, and I say this because um, the French, Third French Republic is pretty amazing. When it begins, it emerges out of a catastrophic military defeat. There are people who want to bring back the, the monarchy, okay? Not Napoleon III, they want to bring back the old French monarchy, the Bourbon family. There are those who want to go all the way in the other direction and are talking about communism. Um, so out of these, this very polarized political atmosphere, this um, uh, republic sort of gradually coalesces, and I mean gradually. Um, their first couple years of its existence, it's tr still trying to deal with this German invasion and occupation. It's not until 1875 that they actually write a constitution. So they're governing for five years sort of ad hoc. But it's the most successful French government to date since the fall of the old monarchy. I don't know if that says something about problems with the French governing themselves or, or where it actually, what it actually should tell us. Um, but it does survive a lot of tests. Um, as a result, to, to end this war and give them some, themselves some breathing space, the leaders of the Republic make a peace treaty with 
now united Germany, which is very problematic for a lot of French people. They give away some territory on their eastern border, these two states, Alsace and Lorraine, which are claimed going, they're fought over back and forth to the Middle Ages. Most French people consider them French. So this is kind of an insult. Um, another thing that really annoys them is the first German emperor, or Kaiser, is crowned at the royal palace of Versailles. So it would be kind of like another country invading the U.S. and crowning their, you know, crowning their leader, appointing their president, whatever, at the White House while we all watch, unable to do anything about it. Okay, it's really humiliating. And because they agreed to this, the government's not going to be very popular coming out of the gate. Um, also, French politics gets extremely divisive. Uh, there, again, there are those who still want to go back to a monarchy. There are those who want this Republican form to last. Um, the, the French army becomes almost its own country for a while, and, and their sole goal is revenge. They want to inflict a humiliating defeat on Germany. Um, one of the things that springs out of that is a, a very famous a series of events referred to collectively as the Dreyfus Affair. This French army captain, Alfred Dreyfus, who has two strokes against him for many of the, the very, cons and, and this should give you an idea of how conservative and reactionary some of these French leaders are. The two strikes Dreyfus had against him, he was Alsatian by birth, so he's been a part of this territory that's lost, and he's Jewish. Okay, and so there's this rising tide of anti-Semitism. He's accused of treason, tried all told three times, um, found guilty three times in a, by courts that by the end all of Europe realized were just a farce. Like there is no justice going on in these military courts. And so finally the government intervenes and literally overturns the conviction. Um, again, alienating part of its constituency. Okay leads France through World War I. And by the way, as far as Alfred Dreyfus went, um, he actually returned to the French army and served in the First World War for four years and ended up retiring as a colonel. So the man they accused of being a traitor, I think, might have been something a bit different. Anyhow, um, leads France through the First World War. Anyone familiar with European history, World War I is devastating for France. I mean, they, they lose... Um, well, four million men in four years. Um, their economy is in shambles. They go from being a creditor nation to being a debtor nation. And they never seem to recover buoyancy. Uh, much of the 20s and 30s are spent with France essentially limping through economically. Um, there's wide-scale unemployment. They start to recover in the late 1920s. Um, just in time to get hit by the Great Depression. And the government is becoming more and more unpopular because none of the programs they attempt seem to really remedy the economic situation. Does that make sense? And, and then it, what adds on are just a series of petty scandals. I'll only talk about one just to, for, for lack of time. You have what's called the Stravinsky Affair. Stravinsky is a small-time small gangster who's arrested by the French police. He's in jail, and he dies in jail. Okay? Um, but the government handling of it appeared, made it look like the jailers killed him. They made it look like a cover-up. It really wasn't. Okay? One of the other prisoners who was from a rival gang killed him basically. Um, but the way the government handled it appears to be more, appears like a cover-up. People become more and more disenchanted. Um, 1940, the Germans invade, and within a month, the French capitulate, okay? That's the end of this Third Republic, and, and what, but what most people see is basically breaks down into two camps. The French military failed is one side of this, that they didn't plan well, they, didn't, they, they had no idea what was coming and so forth. The other side say, well, the French country kind of failed because what happens is the Germans invade, um, the French aren't very well prepared, they do fight as best they can, but the government itself very quickly says, hey, we don't have any popular support they bring this, this hero from World War I, Philippe Patton, out of retirement 
And he very quick, you know, Patan is, is very old at this point, and all he can think of is four years of trench warfare. He doesn't want to see that. And so he just asks the Germans, let's make a deal. And Germany ends up occupied in the north and under a puppet state in the south led by Patan called Vichy. Um, and that's the end of the Third Republic. And a lot of people blame it then on this sort of lack of will, lack of popular support, dissent, discontent, general malaise with the French government. Um, so those are the, the examples of republics that I have. Okay, so what? What can they tell us about the United States today? One thing that sh probably comes across, each one of them ended, you know, ended its existence somehow connected to a conflict. Right? They were invaded and occupied. They lost the war. I, I wouldn't say that that's really it, though. I think each one of these uh, republics and democracy had problems that the war only exposed. You know, like I usually say, a, a war is about the largest stress a society can face over just overall at every level. Um, and I think what it shows us in each one of these cases, okay, in, in the case of the Third Republic, you had a government that was, uh, in a sense, afraid to lead and, and had no clear basis for support. The political situation in France in 1940 was extremely polarized, okay. There are factions very much at either end of the political spectrum, not like that's anything like the United States today. Okay. The Dutch um, also had exp are experiencing economic downturn. Their trading empire is disappearing and they seem I incapable of maintaining it. So their economy is changing and they're not really able to keep up with those changes. The Venetians tried to project force much farther than they really could with any kind of hope for success. You know, they're, I mean, they're, they're basically the, the guy on the block who's, you know, 5'9", like myself, picking on two guys who are 6'10", at the same time. Okay, um, and they realize that they really don't have the reach. Okay, uh, for Rome, the Roman Republic is, was faced with a whole series of different issues that were required reform urgently and so part of it for their government I would say is where do you start? Which one do you pick first? And then when, when you do pick that specific reform who is in charge of it? Is it someone who is actually looking out for the good of the state and the people or is it someone who is looking to line their own wallet? Um, and so in that case, and political, one of the fundamental shifts that happens, Republic, Roman Republican political culture had a very strong sense of ethos that generally erodes between 100 BC and you know, the 59, 58, when Julius Caesar starts his real rise to power. Um, Athens, again, tried to dominate everyone around them in the Greek peninsula and, and that backfires on them in this great Peloponnesian war. Okay, so not, they don't try and be a good friend and ally, they try to dominate, again, their neighbors and so forth. Um, and I think some of these might have some similarities to some of the situations where the United States has faced in recent years or is currently facing. Um, are they, are they exactly the same? And, and when Tammy gave me the introduction, she said, you know, what, what we might be doing in the future. And I have to say, historians can't tell the future, okay? We like you to believe that about us because it makes you guys think we're cool when we're really geeks. Um, but we can only tell you the winning lottery numbers a couple years after the fact, okay? What I hope I've done up here this morning is to, to give some facts and to give some, some, ideas, some interpretation of those that maybe is provoking some thought or maybe provoking some questions. Speaking of which, any questions? And I have a microphone, so raise your hand. I'll come to you. <laughs> Don't everybody at once? Got nothing. Wow. Um, yeah. um, 
wait, wait for the man with the mic. So, um, yeah, Mary. Do you see any of the particular problems facing the United States now to be the primary problem facing the United States? Because it sounds to me like we're facing all of those problems at the same time. Uh, in varying degrees, yes. And, and a part of it becomes then which is the most pressing. I don't know that ours, I mean, on the bright side, you know, a lot of the, the sort of overreach that, that is a problem for the Venetians and, and um, the Athenians, we're at least pretty much out of Iraq. We're pulling out of Afghanistan, and so that's good um, in the near term. And, and hopefully there'll be some, some time to sort of regroup as a result. Uh, I think a lot of uh, the, the domestic issues, ours are certainly different than what were faced by, by say, the Dutch or the Romans, but I think there, there are definitely domestic issues and some that are, that are just very plain that no one seems to really consider important enough to address. You know, one of the things, most bridges in the United States are essentially unsafe. That's not a good situation. You know, and, and, I, and, and I think that brings up the next issue then is partisanship. Well, I mean, if the bridge is unsafe, what purpose is there in fighting over the bridge being uh, fix the bridge? You know? Although, interestingly, in U.S. history, one of the things you find out, um, it's only a very new notion that, and uh, just speaking of things like, you know, um, infrastructure. Early on in the history of the United States, infrastructure projects, road and bridge building, were private concerns. And, and, you know, perhaps that's something that maybe can be privatized again. I mean, you'd have to pay more in tolls, but you might have a better bridge and it might be better kept. Maybe. I don't know. Again, these are just ideas. These are just some things to maybe consider. So, uh, did that answer the question? Good. Thanks, Jim. Uh, with using your context of some of the challenges that have faced previous republics, it, you seem to be setting up that right now we have these similar set of challenges, sure. let's say, of the discontent malaise and government ineptitude. And well, no, that's the French, and <laughs> only the French can okay. have that. <laughs> uh, but what about if you, you're a young guy, but if you were to have this talk in the 1970s, Mm -hmm. after the Vietnam War or yeah. the Watergate scandal. Do you think that this, s the current situation maybe of the United States is, is any more challenging now than maybe at previous time periods uh, with Great Depressions and other wars and so forth? Really good question. Um, I think the first example you give of the 1970s, especially on the, the notion of discontent, malaise, and, and dissent from government, I, I think we're, I would suspect that we are in a much better position with regard to those factors today than we were in the 1970s. Um, most people maybe dislike certain political affiliations or maybe, you know, have opposition. You know, there is partisanship, but most people don't dislike the entire government and expect that everything is, that's coming out is a lie, you know, in, in a broad sense. And, and that's really, to me, looking at the history of it, the post-Vietnam sort of reaction, you know, the credibility gap. You assume that what the president is saying is not true. I don't know that that's necessarily the case today. Um, do we assume that our politicians put a spin on things to benefit themselves? Yes. Is that necessarily cynical? No. I think that might be that as a population, as, a, as an electorate, we're wiser, you know, we're, we're, we're more critical thinkers, which would also, we could take credit for an, as an institution of learning that we've succeeded to some extent in training people to be critical thinkers, maybe. Um, but I don't, I don't think that there's that, that sense of discontent. Um, the Great Depression, I think you're, you have more of a class-based like class sense of animosity going on. You know, the, the working class versus the wealthy. And I, is that prevalent in American society today? I certainly think that it's, um, 
You know, it's, it's interesting when, since you bring it up, um, in 2008, shortly after President Obama was elected, uh, we, I was teaching a modern U.S. history class, and we had reached the 1932 election when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected. And I had my students read his inaugural address, which many of you would know is the, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself speech. Well, if you actually look at the rest of the text of that speech, he talks about the treasonous wealth, the treason of wealth. And my students actually asked, is that an advanced copy of Obama's inaugural? So I think you get that, that at that, but again, that was 2008, just as the economy was melting down. So I, I don't think we're in quite that spot today. Um, I think that are there a lot of, of issues? Yes. Are there a lot of things that need to be addressed? Absolutely. Um, I think the greatest concern is pushing them off. You know, um, not just in the sense of infrastructure repair, but in, in maybe sort of ramping down the partisanship. Much of it is just produced. You know, it's, it's fires fed and, and sort of ratcheting down some of that propaganda by both sides. Um, and, and then getting to some issues to address. But I, I don't know if I, did I answer your question? More than enough? <laughs> Um, in thinking about the larger theme, what is the promise of democracy, and also thinking about the historical context that you put us in with um, the republics of the past, it seems to me, and I'm not a historian, but it seems to me that the, there, there's this notion that somehow discontent with government and the, these sort of problems that exist, be it the economy or war, these other things, are they sort of lead to the fall of a, a government in a way, and I wonder if a democracy in and of itself, is that not the beauty of a democracy that we can be, um, or at least show that we're dis, you know, that we're unhappy with our government and that's a part of yeah. what we sort of enjoy about the democracy? Uh, yeah, and I think it's important to draw a distinction. Are we discontent with our leaders or discontent with our system? You know, I think discontent with leaders does actually work for a democracy because you have that option. If you don't like the, the group that's in power, change it, right? That's, that's the promise of democracy, that you actually have a voice. Um, you know, as opposed to medieval monarchy where if you don't like it, well, too bad. You know, have a riot and hope they don't burn the town down around you. Um, by the same token, I think it's when you get into the territory of being discontent with the system itself. If you start saying, you know, in the Third Republic, people were saying this just doesn't work. Um, you have, and of course, it's not something that the French like to talk about. To, well, most of the French don't like to talk. Like, you have fascist parties in France. You have groups that think the Nazis are really the way to go. Um, and, and there is a, a splinter of that that's still alive in French politics today. Um, Orlan, though he's really making our headlines fun to read recently, is, is probably the better choice because his, his, the candidate who had the best chance against him in the last French elections was someone named Jean-Marie Le Pen, whose party is the, the most modern incarnation of what the French call cr basically cross of fire. She's the extreme, radically conservative. And part of their uh, platform was to expel all the Algerians from France. Just get rid of all Arabs in France, and then we'll be OK. So, so there's that strain that still exists in French politics to, uh, down to the present, just sort of ultra-conservative wing. Um, and, and that's part of the group that were very discontent in 1940, not with the Republican system itself. We need something different. We need something more totalitarian. And I think that's the more dangerous ground to get into. Uh, any other questions? Over there. I'm coming. <laughs> um, so I may be misquoting this phrase entirely, but um, in, I've heard over and over again, if you do not learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. Now, do you think in certain regard or certain regards and certain way of looking at it, do you think our government has 
failed to learn from mistakes of government's past? I mean, do you think that a lot of things in current day government could have easily been avoided if we would have learned from mistakes that others have made? Um, I think there's only so many <coughs> questions you can get right at any given time. And you're always going to have someone who says you got it right. I mean, part of it is you have to, one of the, one of the problems and, and of history is you have to wait 50 years to determine whether or not the answer was right. But I'd still say we've, we've managed to figure out a few things. Um, you know, again, with the, the current events connection. Uh, the worst part of the Great Depression in the United States was winter 1933 because Hoover was a lame duck president, he's not doing anything, and FDR hadn't come into power yet. Well, if you look back at 2008, just as that we were on the cusp of this meltdown, they had these meetings in December, right, between the Bush administration and Obama's transition team. And one of the reasons was so they could agree and get some things passed through Congress so that people, to, to avert us going even farther in because you know, there, there are documented cases uh, not only of starvation but of cannibalism and so forth. Um, it, it gets really ugly in that winter of 33. And so, I, you know, it, but again, it's how many lessons do you actually learn? I think that's a moment where you can say the politicians, pro some of them at least, probably had that winter of 1933 somewhere on their minds. Um, it, it also comes down to a choice of priorities. You know, um, conflicts can. Conflicts can eat up a lot of a lot of the governing mentality, a lot of the brain power of the government. You know, if you're if you're involved in a war, you just end up putting a lot of things to the back burner. And that also is something that the only person who, to my mind, ever tried to to not let that happen was Lyndon Johnson, and it really didn't work out for him. Um, but you know, it, so you have to make these choices, and then it's what do you place important? What do you see as, as the thing that is you must do next. You know, but I think some of them do learn, and, and it comes down to how many things can you get right. Uh, any others? Yeah. I'm coming. Hi, so you said that it was the, a lot of these republics had problems, and it was the wars that exposed these problems. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think are some of the problems that have been exposed with the recent Iraq and Afghanistan wars? Um, hmm. uh, privatization has its limits of usefulness in one sense. Like there are certain things that, that were contracted out by, because they had to be by the military that probably should not have been. Um, that, that some of our ideas um, on the all-volunteer force, maybe not the best. I would say one of the critical things that, we're lear that we learned or, or maybe are on the learning curve for right now, a big problem for the Roman Republic was dissatisfaction among the veterans of their wars. And anyone who's dealt with veterans <laughs> issues recently, hi Jeremy, how's it? Um, <laughs> there's a, there, there are a lot of issues that are coming up at the state and federal level and, and that need to be addressed. Um, service to the state historically has always brought with it a certain understanding of recognition and care by the state afterwards. You lose a leg defending your country, the country will look out for you. If, if, the, if the state doesn't meet its obligation to those people, um, then they're going to lose a really core constituency. Um, and I think that might be one that, that isn't getting enough understanding, isn't getting enough discussion right now. Um, so those are some of the things, I think, uh, that, that it belies. Um, also that... We, we are called the last superpower, and I think that there's a double-edged sword there because that doesn't mean we're an infinite power, you know. Fighting two wars on two different fronts and trying to manage the restructuring of an economy at the same time has proved, I think, beyond our ken, beyond our ability, and so at least in the short term. And I think that it needs, you know, one of the things that actually came across to me out of a lot of these case studies um, was something that the, you know, the ancient Greek word, hubris, and just basically ego, 
You know, the Athenians took on most of their neighbors because they thought they could do it and succeed. And for a while they did, but then when they failed, they lost everything. Um, you know, and I, I think that, and same thing with the Venetians, you know, they succeeded for a while at expansion, but when they failed, they, they disappeared from the map for a while. And I think that, that we have to be very guarded with that notion of, you know, superpower or, or whatever we want to, however we want to qualify ourselves these days or define ourselves, doesn't mean that you are unlimited by it. And, and, and you need to recognize that there are limitations. And that's not a bad thing. It just, it's basically confronting reality and saying, this is what we can do and can hope to do versus what, you know, might be an ideal case or something like that. So I think there are some things that, that it does reveal. Um, or that have been revealed recently because of our recent ex recent history, recent experiences. So, have I bored you all sufficiently? Put you all to sleep, Jim. I ha I have one for you. Okay. Uh, just this week, uh, maybe yesterday, uh, there was a joint task force um, from the president that the president commissioned released findings about um, ways to improve elections in the United States. Um, chief counsel from former chief counsel of President Obama. Mm -hmm. former chief counsel of Mitt Romney, head of this commission, and they said, here's things that we could do to make voting better. Okay. One thing they didn't touch because they couldn't agree on was access to voting. So voter ID laws, right. um, how to open up the polls, how to close down, things like that. Um, is there any historic evidence that the, the wider the franchise, the better? And that seems to be the, the argument we hear from our country, right? The more people that vote, the more problems get solved, the more voices that get heard. Where you've given examples of limits to the franchise, limits to voter participation, and is there, does history teach us anything about that value? Um, there's a loaded question. <laughs> you can count on the librarians for the loaded question. Um, because I, I think it actually is, gets kind of counterintuitive. Um, most, of, most of these, in fact, all of these cases where you do have people voting, it's a very small franchise, right? It's, it's male dominant, um, and in most cases, you not only have to be male, but you have to own property. And their, their reasoning behind this was that if you own property, you're a stakeholder, right? You have something to lose if the country collapses. And even into our own early history, right, the big concern down to Andrew Jackson was that if you give everyone the vote, they'll, you know, if you give the masses the vote, you, you open the doors to people who aren't educated, don't have any stake in the country's success or failure, and because of this, they can be very influenced by demagogues who just seek their own personal gain by getting into political office and, and really will just want to make a career out of being an office holder to collect the revenues therefrom. Oops. <laughs> right. But, you know, they're, they're, that was their great fear. And in some ways, I mean, it's proven to be, so that, well, they might have had some merits in that concern. Um, I think it makes the debate much more robust in the democracy, but they're, they're, I don't think we should hide from that pitfall that maybe the, the founders did have some idea about, you know, that, and, and, not, and I'm not by, by any stretch, by any wild stretch of the imagination, I am not saying that we should like limit the franchise or take the vote away. I think the answer is really to be aware that that, that is, was a real danger and it's actually manifested. You know, we do have people who just want to be career office holders, you know, um, and, and to deal with that what, in whatever way. Um, so I think that, you know, the, perhaps the term limits and, and, you know, looking more at these voter ID laws and what they can do to them, because they're actually essentially doing, sort of trying to take it back to what people had done in the 1700s and early 1800s, which was you have to be um, male, free man, um, meaning in this case especially, uh, you couldn't be an apprentice to someone because the idea was if some, you know, if you're living in someone else's house and depending on them for food and shelter, they can influence your vote. So therefore, you should not have the vote. So male, free man, property owner. So you have a stake in the community and its success or failure, or and pay uh, some form of, you know, taxation. At least in the north, in the in the south, it's a little bit different structure. So. Because in the 1800s, we only had pure politicians that were good at heart. <laughs> <laughs> other no, questions, no. other questions. Anyone? Oh, 
You have one right there. Kind of following up on what you were just saying, I mean, don't you think that also points to, you know, I, I teach political science, as you know, and yeah. so one of the things I try to stress to my students is the importance of looking in the mirror and, and recognizing our role in creating, okay. you know, this system, these problems, and the idea, you know, like you said, almost, you know, yes, politicians can, can manipulate us. You know, that's not, you know, I don't think that's a, uh, a stretch they to can? say. <laughs> but I think, you know, it speaks to the, the idea that, you know, if we educate ourselves, if we inform ourselves, we're, we're far less likely to be manipulated. Yeah. So, so was, was, there, was right? there a question in there? Or, or was well, it? Well, no, I guess that is my, you know, I mean, I think, yeah, it's, I, you know, it's the Jeffersonian ideal, right? The, the more, the better educated the electorate, the, the more critical we will be and we will see this. And again, I think it, it comes back to one of the reasons we're here as an education of learning, or an institution of education, right? an institution of learning, is to, you know, to come out of the, the experience and to look at what the messages are, what's being said, who's saying them, and, and potentially why, and, and not be cynical. I, you know, I think there's a big difference. It's very easy to be politically cynical today as opposed to being politically critical and saying, you know, is this really the best answer Versus, well, it's just, you know, it's just not a good answer, and forget about it. So, I, and I think that's a very important distinction to draw out. Um, yeah, I mean, you do have to confront that in 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 our quest for inclusion, we have there. It's not a perfect road. There are going to be bumps in it, but democracy is something where you don't want seamlessness. I don't think. You know, you need that healthy discussion and debate. And whenever it's stifled, I think that's when you have the real problem. You know. Um, which we which there are also historical examples of, you know, Espionage Act, Sedition Act, and so forth in U.S. history, when we have tried to sort of say, well, no, we're not going to discuss this right now. But it's turned out to be that I think the record does speak very clearly on when we've had the healthy debate, um, we've made better decisions and and chosen better decision makers. So question, uh, question back here. Well. Healthy discussion is good for government, yes, but what happens when you get a flaming row instead of an actual discussion? That seems to kind of be what I'm seeing with the extreme, you know, partisanship. Of with, with polarization and partisanship. Right. There's no compromise. Right. And I think that's one of the problems that we're currently facing. And that's a, I mean, that's a really good question to bring up. But I think you need to have, like, the cooler heads prevail, you know. Um, you can only be inflammatory and maintain people's attention for so long. I think after a while, we just kind of grow deaf to it. You know, I mean, in my personal experience, just to, to give one example, um, you know, when Rush Limbaugh, the, the political pundit, came first came out, he, everybody was talking about it because he was always making sort of semi-inflammatory remarks. Well, now. Does anyone pay that much? I mean, if you hear the name, you expect the next thing to be some inflammatory remark, you know? And, and so I think people don't take it as seriously. Does that make sense? The more exposure you have to it, the, the less it becomes a vital part of the political dialogue, which I think is a good thing because then you can go back and have those cooler heads prevail and you can look at, okay, what is the actual problem and what are some so sets of solutions that maybe we can look at and weigh on their merits? So I, I think it's there, and it's always been there. It's always been there. At least, you know, at, at least in American history, there's always been that sort of fringe element of one ki kind or another. Um, you know, for example, you had, um, and of course the name escapes me right now, Hamilton's assailant, well. Aaron Burr. Thank you. You know, Aaron Burr essentially wanted to go create his own country. <laughs> um, off, to, off in the West, and he was not the only one at the time. One of my one of my favorite figures from the early early national period is a guy who doesn't get much play. His name is James Wilkinson. He was at times in the pay of the British, the French, and the Spanish, and us. He he saw himself as a brilliant secret agent, the working for our enemies. The problem was that Washington, Adams, and Jefferson all knew 
and, and kind of played him back on our opponents. So, you know, there's, but there's always sort of that, that kind of fringe of, you know, Burr knew quite well that he was violating the Constitution and trying to set up a separate nation in the, in the Louisiana Territory. Um, Wilkinson knew quite well that he was doing things that were far from legitimate and, and at times being quite inflammatory. You know, sending a big part of what these guys did to help their various programs forward was to write letters that were just incredibly inflammatory about any potential political rival. And, you know, they're being read by whichever president who's kind of going, yeah, that's nice, and the truth is, you know, asking someone else. So I think you kind of always have, in whatever manifestation, that form of sort of, um, you know, punditry going on. It'll change its form. You know, we don't have, we have talk shows and radio today and, and, and you know, various internet, internet sites as opposed to letter writing campaigns, but it's, it's the same kind of content and it actually gets fairly repetitive. Any others? Okay, I think we're about it. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jim.